I don't know, but I, I really believe and hope and think and pray and all those things that if you are a Christian right now, you are losing sleep because the Spirit is compelling you to pray and to intercede. It is the Spirit that we talk about today, that we celebrate today, but it is this that we proclaim as I, I tried to put a title to things and I wanted to talk about the Holy Spirit and I am going to do that. I'm going to preach from Acts chapter 2 here in a few moments. But if there's one thing that I'm clinging to, one thing that I must proclaim to you today, and it is Jesus is Lord. It would seem all around us that he is not Lord. But all around us is not within my soul. All around us is not what we just sang about. My soul and my heart were scarred and blacked with sin. But praise God. Praise God. You see, we live in a day and age when the Holy Spirit is at work and is active, and the Holy Spirit cleanses us, gives us life anew, makes us new creations. The Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles with me. Again, we have not... I'm going to need a bigger platform. Um... I can't lay this on the ground. It'll stay there forever. Put it right there. I'll remember to go get it. I want you to turn your Bibles with me to neither Acts nor John, but to 1 Corinthians. Yeah, well, clearly. I made sure not to mark my Bible so you can take time and find it in yours as well since I've got you flipping. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, chapter 12, 1 Corinthians. Last night as I was up and reading and praying and considering, I always try to figure out, well, what is the the hook? What, What will I tell? What anecdote will I tell? And there is none to tell. There is simply the Word of God today. The Word of God needs to be enough to grab our attention I truly believe, as I look around our sanctuary, and I don't know who all is online today, but I, I will tell you the vast majority of us understand who Jesus Christ is today, and we would not be watching and we would not be here if we did not desire to worship him and engage in the Holy Spirit this morning and his work within our lives. So I don't need to entertain you with an anecdote. I simply need to proclaim to you what the Holy Spirit can actually do in the midst of this chaotic and fallen world we're living in at this moment. So in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, this is, you see, we're, we're in the day and age of the, of the Holy Spirit. We are well beyond trying to go, oh, look who showed up. We're beyond that. He's here. It is the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. I think one of the disservices that we do to the Trinity and the triune God is we somehow try to tell people that, well, yes, you invite Jesus into your heart, and then later on Jesus moves out and the Holy Spirit comes in and cleanses you. I need to tell you that is a non-Trinitarian thought. It's bad theology, and it doesn't make any sense when we use the verbiage like that. We try to help people understand it's Jesus who died on the cross and he loves you. But I want to tell you the moment that you say, come into my heart, it's the Holy Spirit that enters into your heart. You don't have to wait for your day of Pentecost. I want to tell you, the Holy Spirit is active in your life. We as Nazarenes believe that it's the Holy Spirit that awakened us and drew us and made us aware of our fallen state and our need for a Savior and our wonderment. What can save me from this wretched state that I'm in? And it's the Holy Spirit of God. Because I want to tell you, Pentecost and the first appearance of the Holy Spirit happened 2,000 years ago. Don't be shocked and surprised or wait on it. He is here. Hallelujah. He is here. Praise the Lord. The Holy Spirit. So in 1 Corinthians, and and the reason why I wanted the emphasis on Acts and and what Nee said this morning, and hey, look, it wasn't me. I didn't didn't know it was going to be that big of a quiz for you. I didn't know that. I didn't tell her to quiz you and make you feel bad about things. That wasn't part of my plan. But but I want to tell you today, though, that the book of Acts... Is that book, you see, you got the Gospels. 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we get the story of Jesus and his great love for us and what he did in his life and how that he was turning everything on its end and everything was counterculture and everything was 180 degrees away from what the world thought it should be. And then you've got past Acts. You've got all these letters to the churches, all these writings to the churches. And what the book of Acts does is says, hey, here's how you got churches. Here's how the body of Christ came into being. And it's the Holy Spirit of God. And so we today, we live in the letters. We live in the age where we're responding to the Holy Spirit at work in the midst of the body of believers. And so in this letter to the church at Corinth, where they, even they, were confused about how all this is supposed to work. And they really did like the spiritual gifts. The church at Corinth didn't just like one of them. They liked all of them because the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the church at Corinth. Corinth was a port city. If you can imagine a city with a mixture of backgrounds and cultures, I want you to think about maybe New York. Just a melting pot as we call things in our country today. The, Corinth was an area where they, the tradesmen would come and they would bring all the goods. And, and there, it was such a vast city with vast different beliefs and understandings. That when the church got together there, God poured his spirit out where it needed to be. In the midst of other gods and chaos and a lack of understanding and a lack of tolerance of other cultures. And God poured his Holy Spirit out that his name might be glorified in the midst of all of those because you see, when you come in and you visit, back then you're on a boat or you're on a land and you would travel far distances. You see, at that point, the Holy Spirit poured out in a church there where people would come in contact with it and they would go back. And you know what happened? They would go back and they'd say, let me tell you about what I experienced in Corinth. Let me tell you. what." I, and that's why the Holy Spirit was poured out. But then they thought, yeah, we're better than them. We got all the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was given to them for a reason, for God to be glorified and lives be changed. And they began to use it as, hey, look at us. Individuals began to look at each other. And so Paul writes to them. And he says, now concerning verse 1 of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, he says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that one, no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. I want you to jump down here and look at this verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. I want to tell you today, the Holy Spirit makes us one above everything else. We are first and foremost part of the body of Christ. Everything else is secondary to that, if not tertiary or quaternary. It is below that. Now, I know some, I looked, I had those words up. Casey's like, oh, look, haven't heard quaternary in a sermon in quite some time. Maybe a first for some of y'all. I want to tell you, the Holy Spirit makes us one. Here are the things that it does. It allows all of us to proclaim Jesus is Lord. You see, and it's not just lip service. Let me, let me tell you who else knows and says and understands that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords and knows it to the depths of whatever he is, and that's Satan. Satan completely and fully understands who Jesus Christ is. So the proclamation the Spirit allows us to say Jesus is Lord is not, oh, I got a definition in my mind, and I know what the preacher said about Jesus, and I know what Miss Denise said about Jesus, I know what Schaefer said about Jesus, I've grown up in this church, I know who Jesus is. The proclamation that we have because of the Holy Spirit is one of Jesus is Lord of my life. And I will let him lead me and him guide me. Oh, uh, mm, I'm going to say it. Some of us, me included, need to let Jesus guide us as we scroll on social media. 
We need to proclaim Jesus is Lord over what my eyes see and take into my mind. I hinted at that earlier about how much scripture we're getting. I am attacking the world and its insanity and the work of the devil with the word of God. Because I have to. I got nothing else for you, folks. There's no cheap psychology I can give to you. It is the word of God that will save your soul. Jesus is Lord. The proclamation, Lord of my life. There is no other Lord. He is Lord. It makes us members of one body. I've often said, I know he was holding this, but my left hand here is just so I don't look really goofy. It helps me balance things out and occasionally can help carry things, but oftentimes it, it's really not as useful as my right hand. I'm right-handed. Now, those of you that are left-handed, you may think the same thing about your right hand. But I want to tell you, oh, right hand ain't no better than left hand. Both hands can be raised and praise God. Both hands can be reached out to hug and, and pat on people. Both hands can be used of God for what they intend to be used by God. You, 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 you're, you're left-handed, Doralee, and your right hand is there. But look, we couldn't tell which handed she was playing that piano. You see, God working through changes those things. I, I want to tell you that God works through us, members of one body, meaning that we like, I'll tell you what, as much as old lefty here ain't much good to me, I sure don't want to lose him. I, I don't want to get rid of, hey, just because he's not as good as the right hand, I, I, don't, I don't want to get rid of this one. I remember my grandmother used to sit in front of me. I don't know how she could do this, but she would sit in front of me and she'd say, give me a sentence. And she would put pens in each hand and would write and meet in the middle. So not only was she ambidextrous, could write both directions, but if she knew the sense and could think about it, she could write cursive backwards. I think it was just a trick show for us kids. I don't know how long. That's probably her whole life effort was put into that. I don't know. But, but she said she had to learn. She practiced so much as a, she was one of those, she knew shorthand, right? A lost art. But she knew shorthand. That's what she did for a living. She understood all those things, but she could just write and do things. And she just thought that was, neat to be able to do i don't know what our use it stood for other than to entertain us grandkids but by, i'm telling you what that works ambidextrous use what members of one body we are one because of christ and therefore we love and honor one another it is the holy spirit that makes us one not our will not our thoughts it is the holy spirit that truly makes us one, allowing us to proclaim Jesus the Lord, and that we're one. And it is because we are, as it says there in verse 13, all made to drink from one spirit. We were created to take in the Holy Spirit. We were created to be vessels and temples for the living God. Our reason to be here is to be the place where God dwells and to be his people and proclaim him and the good news to the world and all those around us. That is our goal. That is our reasoning. We are one because of that. Now I want to get ready to jump. The Spirit offers these things. Peace, joy, hope, and glorious freedom. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to John, the 20th chapter. John, the 20th chapter. Like I said, I did not cheat and pre-mark my Bible so I can flip with you. John 20 is just... Just right before Acts, John chapter 20, I'm going to begin in verse 19. Now this is scripture we've been reading the past few weeks. I can't remember which service it was in, but we read this uh, together. Verse 19, this is where the disciples are waiting in that room. They're tarrying in the upper room and Jesus appears to them. Verse 19, chapter 20 of John says, On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said 
this. He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Peace be with you. Verse 21, the Spirit offers you peace. But in receiving that peace and being one in the Holy Spirit, we have these words of Christ to check us up and to challenge us. He says this, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. I want you to know what I see and hear in this. Jesus was sent to suffer and die that we might know salvation full and free. And so I send you. So I send you. And so we go as Christ is compelling us and sending us with the Holy Spirit. He does not send us alone. He does not send us in our own strength as we talked about last week. He sends us in the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim the good news. That's what he does. We have that peace. In Psalm that was you did the responsive reading on, the last verse in that Psalm that you read talks of rejoicing. That 35th verse in the 104th Psalm, it talks of rejoicing. You cannot rejoice if there is not joy present. I keep going back to the, oh, rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel has come. Oh, rejoice, the joy that fills my heart because I know he lives. Joy. The Spirit offers me that kind of joy that what goes on around me cannot steal that joy. I want to tell you, if the circumstances of this world are stealing your joy, get in the Scriptures and see that the joy and peace He offers come from the Spirit living within, and that cannot be taken. This world cannot destroy your soul. This world cannot touch your soul. You turn back just a couple pages in John to the 16th chapter. Bless you. John, the 16th chapter. These wonderful, beautiful, glorious words. The last verse. You know what? We've got to read a little bit of that because it's so good. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's actually saying, you know, you're going to be sorrowful, but sorrow will turn to joy. He comes down here in verse 25 and says this. I've said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. Verse 29. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figure of speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Look at this, folks. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation or trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I want to tell you today, you're looking and you're saying, where will we turn? What will we do? How can things get back to whatever we want? I want to tell you, take heart, Christian. Jesus has overcome the world. So no matter what happens, no matter how crazy it gets, Jesus is Lord. And the Spirit compels us to proclaim that. Take heart, Christian. All of the hand wringing that I see from my fellow brothers and sisters and leaders in churches. And they wonder. I want to tell them today. Take heart church. Take heart pastor. He has overcome the world. He didn't say it's going to be rosy. (laughs) Brace yourself. He never proclaimed in scripture that racism would be eradicated from this world. Now, I will tell you, that does not absolve you of responsibility of your actions. But if you think that our country 
is going to turn into heaven on earth, please read your Bibles. Jesus tells us as Christians, I, I read John, you know you're going to find out? Jesus is going to say, hey, guess what, Christian? The world hates me. They're going to hate you. When we were at the Wild Game Supper over, supper over at First Church this year, the, the speaker proclaimed it. He told us, hey, look, church, the only people who have never disappointed me are people who don't know Jesus. Sinners. You want to know why? They sin. Never shocked to me. He said, what gets me is Christians that sin and don't follow God and don't have the Holy Spirit leading them daily. That's the problem we have. I will tell you, the fallen need to know there's a God who died for them. And the only way they're going to know is if we love them and proclaim that gospel, that Jesus loves them in the midst of their turmoil and their sorrow and in their despair. Hallelujah, glory to God. There is a Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. And he will walk with them and talk with them no matter what turmoil life brings. He is a Savior. We have that hope today. We have that hope. And I couldn't help myself as this was being put together. The last one. I could go to Scripture and talk about freedom. Whom the Spirit has set free is free indeed. Who he sets free is free indeed. But nothing describes what the world needs to know today better than this old hymn. Haldor wrote it, my good friend Haldor. I always want to say Haldor from Mordor, but that's, that's probably wrong in an appropriate year. Once, once I was bound. Church, I want you to think about this. If you're a Christian, this is your testimony. Didn't nobody show up not bound? Didn't anybody show up good enough? Once I was bound by sin's galling fetters, chained like a slave, I struggled in vain. But I received a glorious freedom when Jesus broke my fetters in twain. Freedom from all the carnal affections, freedom from envy, hatred, and strife. I want to tell you, as I saw the news all week long, this verse kept telling me, you know what the world needs to hear today? Through Jesus Christ, there is freedom from hatred and strife. Through Jesus Christ, there is glorious freedom. But it falls on deaf ears because our country so enjoys strife and envy. Freedom from vain and worldly ambitions. Freedom from all that saddened my life. Freedom from pride and all sinful follies. Freedom from love and glitter of gold. Freedom from evil temper and anger. Glorious freedom, rapture untold. Freedom from fear and all of its torments. Picking at your mind. Well, what's going to happen? That's fear. Torments you. Distracts you. Gives the enemy a foothold in your life. Freedom from care with all of its pain. Freedom in Christ, my blessed Redeemer. He who has rent my fetters in twain. Glorious freedom, wonderful freedom. No more in chains of sin I refine. Jesus the glorious emancipator. Now and forever he shall be mine. Glorious freedom today is what the world needs to hear about. I want to tell you that's what the Spirit offers us. Offers us peace, joy, hope, and glorious freedom. Torn by division. We who have had our fetters taken away. We seek to unite and this is where I've got to pull this in. You see, if I don't help you out here today, I'm making an error. If I don't help you out today and say, when we unite, when we talk about being united, when we talk about removing division, we as the church and Christians must first and foremost cling to God and be united by the Holy Spirit. I will tell you, we are all offended when people are murdered by the ones who are sworn to protect them. 
We know people who are police officers, who are firefighters, who are first responders, who serve God through their way of their life. They serve their communities well. But when these things happen, we all agree and can, can unite that no one, no one wishes, desires, hopes, or thinks it's right for someone to die. We all agree on that one. We all can unite around that one. Well, let me tell you something. That doesn't take the Holy Spirit. Should the laws of the land be followed? Doesn't take the Holy Spirit. Should everybody deserve an opportunity to do well? We probably all can agree on that one. And that does not require the Holy Spirit. We can list a thousand things today that we all can agree on. If you're my age, we all agree that Scrappy-Doo was a travesty to the Scooby-Doo show. You see... It's silly, but I want to tell you, that doesn't require the Holy Spirit. We need to be careful because the world, let me bring it back. I don't want to condemn the whole world. Our American society is telling us, even churches are telling us what we care about as Christians and what we don't, and what Christianity should look like, and what it shouldn't look like, and how this, and how that, and none of it mentions being united and made one by the Holy Spirit. None of it mentions that we live in a fallen world where it's broken and it's a mess, and we are called as the church. And if you're a member of the Nazarene church, we are called to walk aside those who are oppressed and the poor. We're called to be charitable people. We do that. If someone's being harmed, we're to stand up for it. That's who we are as Nazarenes. It's in our code of conduct. We believe that we should reach out to those who are, are, are treated less than others. We should stand alongside of them and help them every opportunity. But I will tell you, we are made one by the Holy Spirit. And we are led by the Holy Spirit because there are many gifts. Because here I will tell you, there might be somebody who's called to be a missionary to a foreign country. In the midst of all this anarchy we have, you say, oh, we need everybody here. It makes sense to have them here. It makes sense. For them. I want to tell you what makes sense, folks, is for you to leave your lives before God, humble yourself before him, and do what the Holy Spirit asks you to do. Live so close to him that it's about your neighbor. I stood in my front yard walking my dog. I've taken up my old Walker County ways. I used to take friends from college. We'd go to Walker County to play at Double Puddle. I mean, it was called Twin Lakes, but really it was just puddles. It was a golf course. I called it Double Puddle. It wasn't much nothing. I'd take them out there, and as we drive by on the back roads of Walker County out there outside of Jasper, you drive by, you just throw your hand up. I will tell you, I drove 269 so many years, it's not even funny. We got some folks who live down that neck of the woods. I wanted to see neck of the woods. And I will tell you, you throw your hand up, you wave, and what do they do? Hey, wave right back at you. And my friends, you say, do you know them? No. <laughs> when I'm walking the dog in the front yard of my house now and people are passing me by, even if their windows are blacked out or whatever, I don't care. I throw my hand up. I give them a wave. You know what happens? They wave back. It starts there, people. I can do that without God, but I want to tell you, I only do that because of God. Because I'll be honest, I don't want to exercise that much. I really, in my heart of hearts, really don't care if somebody's driving by the house. But you know what? God has compelled me. Maybe they need a hand wave today. Maybe they need to see a fat old white guy with gray hair wave at him. I don't know. But the Spirit has told me, guess what? Just like when you raised up and you grew, grew up there in Walk County, you wave at everybody, you wave at everybody here in Pleasant Grove as well. Be aware of the worldly call. Now, I'm going to get on some toes here for just a minute before we get closing. I know you're like, we're on, to we're on toes yet? I, we live, help me out here. I, 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 I don't mean, I, I, <laughs> this is what societal racism looks like for us. I'm going to say some words. Better school system.
I got to go and move. I got to get out of this, the community. The schools are going down. Why are they going down? We, we went, Pleasant Grove, when I moved here 25 years ago, was vastly, predominantly white. And then people of color began to move in, and people began selling their houses. That's called systemic and cultural racism. And, and I've proclaimed to people who I want to have conversations with me. Well, you know, violence is going to come. And I said the most violent thing that ever happened that I can recall in Pleasant Grove since I've been here is four white kids beat to death a white grocery man in his front yard. And I will tell you to this date, we haven't had anything as horrific as that happen in Pleasant Grove. This is systemic and cultural racism. And here's the other one you want to fight. And again, I hate to say that, but this is what, when they say systemic cultural racism, social racism, the, the entities that are put together, this is what I mean. Property values drop. Look on the maps, go to Zillow, do whatever you want to do. You're going to find out that the communities change based on who's lived in them. And it's not just people of color, it's other ethnicities as well. It's systemic, built into our culture. Why does a realtor care? What's the difference? That is what we battle as a church. People. That's what we battle as Christians. It's what I struggled with, still struggle with every day, to be conscious of what's around us, to be led by the Spirit to proclaim no. Not on my watch, not today, not to the individual I'm in contact with. It's out there, folks. Be aware of it. Be aware of the worldly call that calls you away from what God has called you away to do. Seek the Holy Spirit's leading in your life. From last week, this is still true. What will we do? Clothe ourselves with humility toward one another. Humble ourselves under his hand. Cast our anxieties upon him. Be sober-minded and watchful. Resist the devil by standing firm in the faith that we have. Through the power of the Holy Spirit today, that is what has been brought about. It's for us to be able to do this. So many articles telling us what to do, but I want to tell you, we should get in the Scripture and follow the Holy Spirit. Now, enough of the introduction. Oh, that's nervous laughter. Good. Now, this is the end. Acts chapter 2. Well, I told you we'd get there. Honestly, this is the last time you've got to flip in your Bibles. Acts chapter 2. Well, this Sunday. Acts chapter 2. We all know the story. We all read that. We did uh, Acts chapter 1 on our Tuesdays with Ramona this week. Peter gives the sermon at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit has fallen. The Holy Spirit is here. He is, transforms me. I've preached on, on this scripture before. In verse 16, we quote the prophet Joel. Peter does. This is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I put this up there, and we read from Second from Second Corinthians, First Corinthians. Oftentimes, when we get to the day of Pentecost, we begin talking about the gifts and things. And that's already been discussed in scriptures. What's important there? Acts chapter 2 has already talked about that, speaking, the speaking in tongues and the known languages. It, it's very clear in chapter 2. You have to go elsewhere if you want to get an understanding of speaking in tongues. But Acts chapter 2, don't go there. It's plain, very plain, known languages, okay? Very plain and clear in that, that moment. But Peter's standing there, and he proclaims this from the prophet of Joel. In the last days, 
The question I put up there on top of the, the, the slide for you says, what do you think is important? I, I want to tell you, too often we think about all the end times things. Oh, and the moon's going to do this, and the moon's going to be that, and all this is going to happen to the earth around me, and it's all going to be chaos, oh, it's going to be fire, oh, it's, oh, it's all going to be miserable. That ain't important, folks. The important thing as Christians is this last statement. The important thing for us being led by the Holy Spirit is this last statement that is made. And it is simply this from the prophet of Joel. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want to tell you, church, in this time of confusion, we should not be deterred from our main goal, which is to have folks proclaim Lord Jesus as Savior. We cannot move from that. That is the glorious truth of the matter. Jesus is Lord and the Holy Spirit is with us and helps us proclaim that he indeed is our Savior. It's not all these other things that are important in this, in this chapter. The thing that we rejoice in as Christians is that if we will call on the name of the Lord, we will be saved. We want to do everything else but call on the name of the Lord. We want to do everything else but pour our lives into Scripture. We want to do everything else but seek God first in our lives. And that's why we're in a mess as the church. Not society, folks. Society's going to be a mess. But the problem is now, we have in our culture and our society here enjoined ourselves so closely with culture and society that we cannot undo ourselves unless we have, as Larry prayed for us, revival of the Holy Spirit within the church. I don't need just revival outside these walls. I don't need revivals in, in Bo's heart. I don't need revival in Nisa's heart. I need revival in my heart. I want the Holy Spirit to start with me. I want to be cleansed like I've never been cleansed. I want to sell out for God and say, no matter what, I belong to you. I don't want the noise of the world. I know I live here, but I am a part Glory to his name. Church, very soon they're going to tell us. That's good preaching right there. <laughs> For those of you at home, we, we had it pop on Facebook here in the church. I want to tell you folks, very soon, very soon it's going to be that you can only be church and Christian if you do as I say. Worldly people saying it. Let me be very clear. As your pastor, what I will tell you to do is what I've told you to do the past two, three weeks. Humble your... Right, I'm telling you, he's good. That guy's good. Who is he? Find out who that guy is. He's, I like him. Yeah, it, it's, all, it's all good. I, I, Dor, Dorley likes me. Um, I, I, didn't, I apologize. I do. I'm sorry. I didn't, I, no, I didn't want to say your name. I'm sorry. I did, though. <laughs> it's, all, it's all wonderful. As your pastor, I will never tell you what actions make you a Christian. I will tell you continually, seek God first. I might tell you, you might want to pray about that to make sure that you're walking with God. But I'll never start issuing edicts of what we got to do in order for us to be called Christian here. We will be led by the Spirit, always. I want that for you. Call on his name today. I hope I've not been harsh. I hope I've spoken with greater clarity than I did in the middle of the night as I was preaching this to myself. And even greater clarity as I was getting ready this morning. The world is offering us something that is not the Holy Spirit. It's, it's just that simple. If you don't hear anything else today, the world is offering you something that is not God. My chief role as a pastor is to tell you that. I got to go be Jesus before others, and so do you. I'm not going without the Holy Spirit. You shouldn't either. I want you to stand for prayer today. Thank all those that were joining us online. My prayers are with you. Prayers are with all those that we love here in the church. Pray for our board. We'll be 
meeting this evening via Zoom after the evening time together. I encourage you to pray for the board as we talk about next steps that every two weeks we're going to be meeting. This gives us two services under our belt. Text or email or something if you've got a comment for us to consider. If you just want to be judgmental, uh, send that to somebody else. I like constructive criticism. Regular old criticism, not my cup of tea. Uh, being honest. I want to pray for you. The Holy Spirit's not leading you. Yield to him. Humble yourself before him today. On this day of Pentecost, it's good for us to remember that we are indeed filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, once again, when we get done praying, we're just kind of dismissed from the back. So you that are up front, be just a little bit slower. Let folks get out in here. Oh, yeah, remember, Bo just gave me the universal sign for tithe and offering. Remember, tithe and offering boxes are back there in the back. We do. I, I can't thank you enough, church. Cannot thank you enough. Sheila can't thank you enough. She doesn't have to worry about things right now. Y'all are too good. We're, we're able to do more and be more generous than we've been in ages because of your faithfulness to God. And I will tell you, it's sacrificial. We have folks in the church that are hurting but are still giving. Thank you. Thank you so much for your faithfulness to God. It's not just faithfulness to the church. It's faithfulness to God, and it shines through in your lives. I thank you enough for the witnesses that you are. But as we dismiss today, of course, those in the back be a little bit quicker. Those in the front be a little bit slower. Those in the middle, come in second. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, been a lot today. I pray, Lord, that we've honored you. All we were trying to do. I pray, God, that we we served you well. All I want to do is honor you with my life. Lord, I pray for this congregation, for these people, for those that are online, Lord, they're part of us. We think to our prayer requests coming in from all over. We lift them up, Lord. Pray, God, that your Spirit speaks to folks. I pray, Lord, today that the Holy Spirit guards our hearts and our minds. Pray, Lord, that you help us to seek your face, to seek your guidance in our daily lives. I pray, Lord, that you use us in whatever manner to be a healing balm in our society. Open our eyes to see and to love as you would, as you do. Fill our hearts. Give us new hearts that we might love as you love. Lord, I pray if there's anyone in the sound of my voice right now who's struggling with whatever it may be, I pray, Lord, that right now your spirit speaks to them deeply. Do the work of the spirit today in our midst. Encourage those that need encouraging. Convict those that need convicting. But change and shape all of us. Fashion us into your image. And may we not be ashamed that we sing the children's song, He's Still Working on Me. May that not force us to give up or encourage us to quit. May it encourage us to take one more step because we realize that you're at work in our lives. Bless and keep us now in the center of your will. Help us, Lord, in this, our hour of need. Give us opportunity to praise your holy name. And we're going to give you the credit, the glory, and the honor, for you are the only one worthy. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask all of these things. Amen and amen. Thank you. God bless. God bless you. You may be dismissed from the back on out. Just keep your distances as you leave. We thank you so much for another glorious day in the Lord. Praise his holy name. Remember, church board.